Everybody, welcome to another episode of Impact Theory. I am here today with Gary Bishop. Gary, welcome to the show, man. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Dude, I'm excited. I love the way that you think about the world. Uh, I love the sort of brash uh, aggression that you come at things with, the sort of no bullshit approach. Um, so I'm very excited to dive into that. Now, you you have several books, um, the most recent being about amazing fucking wisdom, living a life, um, a wise life, if you will. One thing you said that really blew me away is this notion that we are both the the agent in the matrix and the rebels, as you call it, or, you know, Neo, Trinity and the group. What yeah. do you mean by that? To what extent do you see that we're sort of creating our own reality and how do we develop the wisdom to navigate that well? Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot there's a lot um, about that that, we, that seems so uh, unreal to us when you think I create my own reality, okay? And because, you know, you reach out and you touch the table, right? It's not like you're imagining some holograph or something, right? But, but you, are, you are creating your own experience of being alive and your actions are coming, very much coming from your experiences. So when I talked about you're both the matrix and you're the rebels, um, all of us, all human beings are constantly setting up the game, uh, setting up the game subconsciously. So you're setting up the game of relationships, you're setting up the game of finances, you're setting up the game of your body, you're setting up. And so you're kind of following predictable pathways. And, and, and but you're also struggling with some of these things, right? Like, for instance, I'll give you a really simple example. If I'm somebody who struggled with money, and I know that saving money is really good for me, why would I spend my last hundred bucks at the mall? Like, why would I do that, right? Until you start to consider, well, maybe what I'm doing is I'm setting up the struggle. Maybe that's the game for me subconsciously. But if you take that same principle with your body, with your love life, with your career, see how you fundamentally relate to yourself is very deep, very profound. But you're so wrapped up in the surface issues of your life, you can't really see what's driving it all. Like, how come I turned out this way? If you get if you set aside the kind of psychological explanations, how come I turned out this way? And where am I headed? Where's this going for me? How does this keep unfolding for me? And the surprising thing for a lot of people is whatever you're struggling with today, until you finally understand what's driving, you'll continue to wrestle with that until you die. Talk to me about that process. So one thing that I find really interesting in your story is how late you came to the game of sort of self-help. Um, yeah. what, what was that process like for you? How do we develop the self-awareness to have these kind of moments that you're talking about? Yeah. Uh, one, of, one, of the, one of the interesting aspects of what, when people talk about awareness these days, what I feel as if they're mostly talking about is being aware of others. So they're talking about how others speak and others listen and others behave. And real awareness is, is actually starting to get aware of oneself. And, and I think if you ask most people, they'll say they are pretty aware. Um, but, you know, give me 10 minutes with them and they'll see how blind and deaf they've been. You know, like they just can't, they just, they aren't connected to their own wiring in many ways, you know. Do you have most like a series of questions that you ask people to, to help them see that they aren't as aware as they might think they are? Yeah, well, you know, basically I get people just to tell me about themselves, right? You'll, you'll, hear, you'll, hear the, you'll hear and see the blind spots everywhere. They're all over their conversations. So when somebody talks, they're in fact speaking from the world that they're in. But people don't experience themselves as being in a world. We experience ourselves as being in the world. But you're not. You're in a very biased, a very kind of slanted, a very kind of weighted place in life. You're you're not interacting with life. You're interacting with you interacting with life. And that's a very that's a very kind of nuanced thing. And when you start to point to some of those things with people, you start to say, like, well, well, how come this is something that you get hooked by or how come this is a strength of yours, but also a weakness of yours? Um, that's when people start to join the dots up for themselves. It's really not about telling people. It's really about asking the right kind of questions and engaging in the right kind of conversation with somebody 
that you can, you'll watch them. You'll see people joining the dots up for themselves. Like, oh my gosh, yeah, that that, and then my in my view, a, a human being starts to really get empowered with themselves when they start to make sense to themselves. Like your own actions, your own thoughts, your own emotional states. When all that starts to kind of logically click for you, to me, those are the beginnings of, of true awareness. So by way of example, walk me through what happened to you. So I know your brother-in-law had suggested that you go to a self-improvement seminar of some kind. Right. He thought it was bullshit, but you ultimately end up going because he's footing the bill. Um, right. And you walked away sort of thinking very differently about that. And I think it will help people to to begin to connect those dots if they understand sort of what some of those dots are. Um, right. And using just your own story as an example, I think would be super enlightening. Well, it was the first it was the first time in my life that I ever realized I had a perspective. Right? And did I mean, you know you were struggling with something at that point? Um, I, like everybody else, you know, it was like, well, you know, it's tough to start a business and it's tough being married and you know all the same things that we're all kind of like making okay in our lives you know and sometimes it goes too far like our you know our, our relationships break down or our businesses go down or but it seemed to me like i'm just wrestling with the same stuff as everybody else you know and and i'm working my tail off at that time in my life and a very specific thing that i thought would answer a lot of these questions that were kind of ruminating in my life, right? Like I really I really did believe that one day this was all gonna turn out, right? Which was one of the illusions that I had to really confront, that it was never Meaning turning that your out. your life would automatically become what you wanted it to become, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, it'll be one day when all of this work, I would wake up and the birds would be singing, right? And that sun would be shining and all is good in my world. And I realized that I'd never had that day in my life. Like I'd, I'd been working towards it. I've been trying to make this happen. But when, but you know, that's perspective is a word that gets thrown around a lot. Like what is your perspective? It's such a thin word to deal with this really uh, kind of voluminous thing. It's just a, it's a, your perspective is, is in everything you hear, everything you see, everything you say, everything you experience, every feeling, every emotion, you know, uh, all of it, that's your perspective. And it's hard to see it because you're in it. So you can't really witness it. So when I started to do work on myself, I'd, and, the, and it was in a specific area, actually. It was in my relationship with my parents, which at the time in my life, I would have said was fine. Right? It's okay. You know, it's fine. But I, but I never realized that fine was bullshit. You know, I thought fine was just fine. I, no one had ever said, but why not amazing? And once I started to dig down in that, then I could see, well, because of this and because of that, and because of this and because of that. And it was the first time in my life that I'd ever really confronted that that was just a point of view. Like my entire past is only a perspective. It's not, it's not the actuality of my past. It's the past of the eyes and the ears of the person who was in it. But there was a lot of people in that past with their own eyes and ears with a whole different takeaway from it than I had. But I lived like what I took away was now what is like the firm foundation under my feet. So I questioned everything. It was very unsettling at the beginning to actually question what, like the narrative. And I'd never questioned the narrative, like truly questioned it because I'd never seen it. Because to me, it was the truth. And that's the problem. People spend their adult life overcoming a truth that they made up. Dude, that, that to me is one of the most important things that I've heard you talk about is that notion that people confuse what they have chosen to believe with objective truth and that that sort of becomes that first aha moment of, wait a second, I'm living a collection of beliefs that have formed a perspective. I'm living from that perspective. Um, how do you help people see that? Do you get pushback? Because you've talked about how people will fight for um, their bullshit, I think was one of your exact quotes. Like they, they have all these dysfunctional things in their life and they're, they're just utterly committed to keeping them in a way. Yeah, well, let me, let me get, shine a little bit of light on that. So a, a lot of what we're, we're kind of hooked by as an adult is from – whatever we took away from our childhood, right? So in my second book, I talked about this, like 
what are the elements that you took away? What have you built your life upon? Of all the things that you could have taken, what did you take, right? And so when you question that with somebody and somebody says, you know, like, my mother was controlling, okay, which is a descriptive term of things you saw, okay? When I say my mother was controlling, that's not just a, a phrase. I'm now in a world that exists now between her and I, right? And in this world that I'm in with her, it's not my perspective. I'm actually watching her do things that confirm what I've come to believe. I mean, I completely ignored all the other stuff, but I want to focus on this shit, right? Because this to me is the big deal. And so when I say to somebody, but what if your mom isn't controlling? And they say, well, she is. And I say, I know, but what if she's not? What if you just let go of the notion that she's controlling? Well, I'm not going to let go of that. Why? She's ruined my life. I say, no, you've ruined your own life. And then people start to fight for the narrative. Why? Because they've built the life upon it. And they've told other people about it. And they've got a consensus around them. And so they've filled the life with these people that are like, yeah, your mother's controlling. And you're like, yeah, that's right, she is. And then when I go into my relationship as an adult, this person's not going to control me. And even if that person is controlling me or not controlling me, I'm going to point to all the ways that I think they are. And then it's like I've married my mother. No, you're indulging your perspective. And you never get to see anyone beyond your own perspective. And that's very confronting for someone because if you've spent... 10, 20, 30, 40 years, there's a carnage. There might be divorces. There might be bankruptcies built on the illusion of control. And and then it's like, then you start to see, like, I've, I haven't been interacting with life. I've been interacting with my, my, my view of it, my judgment of it, my opinion of it. And that's sometimes really challenging for some of stomach. You've said that for you, it was a multiple year journey to um, begin to extricate yourself from that, to begin to make some forward momentum. How much of that was, okay, now I recognize that I, I am sort of the matrix itself. I have created this um, illusion to some extent, but it's tied enough to reality that I can reach out and touch it and everything is sort of reconfirming back to me. Um, once you realize that, how did you begin that work of recrafting the narrative or or to you is it it's not a recrafting of the narrative it's it's a disillusionment of all narrative um in totality like what what is that next step that's a great question no one's ever asked me that question again so and i've done a lot of these things so that's a great question um so ultimately what it comes down to is see once you discover something right and it's like a true discovery it's a gestalt moment it's like a, it's like you, the black cat. You're like, oh, you know, what? <laughs> what am I in? You know, how did I? Because you can see the tentacles and you can see how it's spread throughout your life. And you can see how when you're being given by this thing, why you would take the pathway you would take. Like I said earlier, suddenly I made sense. And when I can see the pathway, I don't even have to avoid the pathway. There's just no way I'm going down there because I see the carnage. I get what this has done in my life, right? Now, I don't blame myself. I'm not in the world of like, oh, you idiot. Why didn't you? No, we're all wired as human beings to create our own reality. The only problem is we have no sense of creating it, right? There's no experience of like, yeah, I'm putting this world together for myself so that I can survive in life. Your brain is putting the building blocks together. It's like, yeah, people are this way. Yeah, I'm this way. Yeah, the world is this way. And so I'm just building evidence for it. So I would say that was really the first time where I started to get a sense of an awareness of self, of a self, right? And 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 then it, then it kind of got like, it really was this very kind of existentialist, you know, kind of thing going down with me. It was like, it was like who I knew myself as wasn't really me anymore. It was it was who I'd become. But I started to explore this kind of greater self, like that that was there, but it was only a small part. And that became the big choice in life, like starting to see like I could pursue all of those brain patterns and all of those automatic behaviors. I could pursue that. 
or I could recognize when it's at play. And when I can recognize when, if you want to call it my default self, I believe that's what Heidegger called it, your default self. If I can recognize my default self, I'm suddenly a choice, right? Like, so if I use that example of maybe my relationship to somebody in my past was that they were controlling, I could notice all those patterns, all those triggers, all those emotions as only that, patterns, triggers, and emotions. And then I could start to explore life and set them aside. Like, I'm not going to indulge them because it, it starts to show up for me like a personal indulgence. Like, I'm checked out. I'm in my head. I'm, you know, whatever my thing has got me hooked. Um, but then suddenly as a human being, there's like this growing sense of like there's way more to me that I had forgotten. And I'd literally forgotten. I'd forgotten that when I was a kid, I was so loving as a kid. I was like this huggy, loving little kid. And I'd become this asshole of a man. And that was my choice in many ways, you know. It was like, oh, yeah, I can keep going with that and single-minded and da-da-da-da-da. Or I could just start giving a damn. And I could start getting interested in other people and, and the people in my life. And and it exploded. My life became like a whole a playground for me to explore my relationships with people. And, and, and the thing that I loved about it most was that they didn't have to do shit. You know, like that, they could just sit around and be themselves, and I would be like, "Oh, this is me. I'm going to try. I'm going. I want to discover you from the perspective of love. Like, how? What's yeah, I think you, you got to tell the story of your mom. This is such a powerful moment. And if you would touch on the moment where you hadn't seen your mom in two years, and you show up at the door, um, yeah. I thought the the sort of way you said, "I in the past I would have reacted one way, and now I just had this totally different perspective." Right. Um, I think it's an amazing story. Well, so this this perspective was. I'd seen that I'd created this dynamic between my mom and I. There was, I had a relationship with her, but there was always something in the middle. So it wasn't free, right? Let me put it this way. I wasn't free. When I was around her, I had to be a certain way. And the way that I was, was disconnected, right? Like you're there, I'm here. And what was in between us was all of that narrative that I'd built up over the years. And, And in many ways, you know, and I, and I remember saying this to myself as a teenager, like 16, 17, like I've turned out as a victory over her, right? This is my victory, right? Not like I've turned out from what she did and what she gave me. I've actually just turned out, you know, as a, as a reaction to all the mistakes that she made. And so as a man, when I started to do this, this work, I realized that I'd spent most of my childhood in judgment of her, like how she was doing with me. And and mostly, it was like a scorecard, you know, oh, no, you screwed that up, no, you fucked that up, oh, you screwed that up, oh, yeah. You. So my, I had this like case, like if we went to court, I could have threw a bunch of paperwork down and said, you know, read that, you know, this is how she messed me up and this is why I'm a champion now because I've come victorious. And there's a big conversation in society for that, like being victorious over something you made up. Right. But but it's not they don't say it's being victorious over something you made up. They say it's being victorious over what they did to you. Right. It's what you made up about what they did to you. Or as Sartre would have said what you made it mean. So I had this realization that I that I that I'd really just blamed her. And so uh, when it hit me like a ton of bricks and I went through all the spaces, blame, guilt, fault, you know, all that shit, called it up. And I I used to call my my mom up all the time then. But we all never talked about the weather and the neighbor's dog and stuff. And that was connection, you know, like that was us being connected. So I called it up and she said, hello. And I just said, you know, I'm sorry. That was the first thing I said. I said, I'm sorry. And she's like, for what? And I said, I just never knew what it was like for you to raise a family almost on your own. And I just blamed you. And, I, you know, I've been judging you and I've. You know, I just want you to know I'm just really sorry for making you wrong for all that you did and didn't do. And there was a silence. And I said, I love you. And she said, I love you too, baby. And I had in that moment, like it was a, it was like, oh, my gosh, like the skies opened up. Because all of this that I'd been holding back came out. Right. And I didn't even do it 
so that she would do anything. I did it because this needed to be said. This needed to get out of the way. I was starting to realize how tight I'd become. I wasn't. And I, and I wanted to be a loving man. I just didn't know how to do it. And now I, I remember even saying that to my wife, you know, in my, when I, uh, at the time, like, I don't really know how to do love, which is bullshit. Everybody knows how to do love. You might have forgotten, but you need to get back in touch with it. So from that moment, I really started to engage with my mom from this loving place, you know, like, and she didn't have to do anything. I was just going to love her. And uh, and it wasn't like a test, you know. If I love you, what do I get back? Like, kind of stuff, you know, like like your aunt does when she kisses you, you know, like she's, and she says she loves you. She's kind of waiting for you to say it too. I wasn't doing that. And so I had this business trip to, to, to uh, uh, Dublin, actually, in Ireland. And I, and I was there for a few days. So I thought, I'll just take a quick flight over to Glasgow, my hometown. I'll go see my mom. So I took this early morning flight and I get this car and I drive over there and it's like 8 a.m. And she lived in one of those buildings, you know, you had to press the button at the front to get in. And I thought, well, this is going to blow the surprise because I'll press it and she'll know it's me. But the postman had left the door a little ajar. So I was able to get in the front door. I go in and I knock on her door. And it's like 8.30 on a Monday morning, you know, and I'm like, this is going to be awesome. I haven't seen my mom in two years. It's going to be amazing. And then so I knock on the door. She comes to the door. You know, she looks at me and she goes, what do you want? (laughs) (laughs) That's so good. So I remember at the time, like the thought was there, like, oh, shit, this is where I would usually get really pissed off. Like, see, you don't care about me. Right. And I just laughed. I was just like, oh, my God, that's what she does. Right. That's her thing. She like she gets annoyed. Right. (laughs) Because I'm like showing up at her door on a Monday morning. It's not like. I haven't seen you for two years. It's like, I'm having my tea right now, you know, or something. So I went in and we just had this brilliant conversation. I hugged her. I said, I love you. And I, and I really got, I'd spent my whole life waiting for people to love me. And it was really my job to love people like the way they are. Like it was the whole dynamic changed. Like I would, I remember like even my mom passed away earlier this year. I remember I was over there last year and I was hugging her and she was like, arr, arr, get off me. <laughs> and I just got, that's her thing, man. It's like, that's where she's at. And I'd spent so much of my life like blaming where she's at for where I'm at. And I, th- when I took that off the table, when I took responsibility for being the guy that I say I am, then suddenly people are free to be themselves. I don't need you to change. It's not, I don't need you to say or do something to make me feel different. I just need you to be whatever you say you are. And then in that space, I get to explore all the paradigms of, of who I am. Yeah, dude, the, the thing that makes that story so heartwarming and useful is that she didn't need to change. There was nothing that her behavior didn't change. That's why I love the the moment where you come to the door and you have this such a different reaction than you would have had, you know, in years prior. And I, I there's... You have the same skepticism for sort of self-help that I have. And because so often people are promising sort of rainbows and puppies and it doesn't play out like that and the world is still messy and it's still difficult. And so hearing how she, it, it wasn't like you guys have this phone call and then everything is better and you guys are, you know, you have this easy relationship from, from then on. You, you still had to confront that moment at the door, but now you're able to laugh at it and sort of enjoy who she really was, not need her to be different, not judge her for it, recognize that you're your own thing, that if you make different choices, you can get a different outcome, um, and that she doesn't have any power over you that you don't let her have. Um, right. It's just amazing. I think that's an important part of that, and that is, um, and, and this was part of my great, awakening if you like and it was more like the great punch in the mouth right it wasn't like you know i'll get hit by a rainbow or something it was like i got smacked around the face and the edge and i was like <laughs> right i'm like this is terrible uh, at the beginning but I-, I had to question myself with what would it have been like for me to share my life with somebody who wanted me to be different all the time like, what would that have been like? What would it have been like to share life with somebody who's just like, I don't like this about you. I don't like that about you. I wish you were more that way and less this way. It would have been exhausting. And and and, and even then, then, then I started to get a respect for her. Like, And she held in with me after all of that. 
I'd spent so much time just looking and observing and judging what she was doing. I'd, I'd forgotten to keep an eye on what I was doing and, and who I was becoming. Yeah, you you quoted Heidegger and you sort of referenced it obliquely a minute ago that um, freedom is overcoming the default self. And right. that to me is so powerful, like recognizing that – you use this analogy of a sponge, right? So we're all like a sponge and you start and you're flexible and you're, you're squishy and wonderful. And then over time, all those things that you pick up, it, you dry out and they get trapped. And, and that to me is such a great um, way of illustrating what the default self is. Um, it isn't you intrinsically, but it is sort of the state of you as you have accidentally become over time. Um, and the ability to not react just because that's sort of the accidental way by which you have become, but to yeah. say one, that's shapeable. And then two, that even, even sort of as I'm in this hardened state that you can transcend that, um, and realize that you control your reactions. That's there's, really, really powerful. There's something really great about what you're saying, because see, I, I think your personality is little more than a stumble, right? What do you and mean by stumble? So like you've kind of like fallen through life, and ended up this way, right? So it's kind of like being you've kind of what, and then the next thing, and then you've did. There's been no sense of creating something, you know, like I'm going to create myself for this person. So if you think about it like this kind of unconscious stumble through life, and you're picking up pieces that you have no sense that you've picked that up, right? You don't, you don't even realize that this you've just laid a foundation for something that later in life is going to kick your ass. Right. You don't realize that you're doing this. And so I think when I think it does take a little bit of time, a little bit of kind of fermentation, I think it has to kind of form itself. To me, those are the times when it's ripe for you to now do this work on you to now be like, OK. And, and it's funny because I, I, I spoke to someone recently about this and they talked about midlife crisis. And I don't really see it like that. I don't see it as like an age thing. I think it can happen in your 20s. And I think it can happen in your 60s. And, but I describe it a little differently. I think what you're witnessing is this kind of bankruptcy of your persona. Like who you've come to know yourself as no longer works. Right? And it's the same shit. And no matter how hard you shake that tree, you're only ever getting one apple. Right. It's not bearing the fruits um, because your persona, your personality has come together over time to allow you to overcome life, to win at it, if you like. But the problem is what you're overcoming is what you've picked up and you, you think you should overcome. So you're, you're basically spending your life waging a war against an illusion with a persona that is only designed to win that illusion. But so you're not equipped for the rest of life. You're not equipped for it. And that's, to me, that's real personal growth and development. And when you start to understand that, that little hard sponge and what's at the core of it all, and then start to, then the exploration begins. And then you can maybe start to engage with something close to the true joy of life, you know, to, to get out there and, and be someone you've never been before. I want to go deeper on that. So it, be interesting to hear your take on what the trajectory of your books has been. Um, I was surprised in a great way by your most recent book where you're dealing with this, the self-labeled fundamentals of life, um, talking about love, talking about loss and grieving. Um, and, and the way that I interpreted it was your early books were sort of setting up a worldview, a way to think about things, a way to think about yourself and move through the world, how to you know deconstruct the matrix and build it back up. Um, was something more useful. And now this book is, hey, all those things that I taught you, I'm going to show you how to point it at these most important, powerful elements of life. Um, yeah. And done in a really interesting way. Is that fairly accurate to the intention? Yeah. So when I wrote my first book, um, I mean, you know, you, you pointed to it earlier, you said you just kind of, you've got this kind of, relationship to the self-help industry that's skeptical, right? 
I like that it's skeptical and not cynical. You know, it's it's skeptical. It's like, you know, uh, let me question that a bit. Which all the cynicism is just you're just shutting the door on it, you know. But so I love I love the idea of being skeptical. Um, and I'm and I'm very skeptical at the end of, about the industry because I feel as if I don't think it serves the people who want it. Right. It's like philosophy. Right. I mean, I love philosophy. I'm, I'm not a I'm not a student of philosophy, but I, I dabble. Right. It's like I dabble in playing the guitar. Right. We were talking about that earlier. So I dabble in philosophy. But my problem with philosophy is it's too interested in itself. So it's kind of philosophy is fascinated with itself. Right. It's a subject matter. It's like. Oh yeah, let's talk about Schrodinger's fucking cat or something, you know, like but how does that help me? I just lost my job, you know, like how do how does this so um so I, I, when I wrote my first book, it was te- it was really like and and a kind of rebellion against the self help and to see and you know, it's got a big curse word in the title. Um, yeah, you should you should tell people the titles of your books. I think they right, are so my, first, my first book was called Unfuck Yourself. And when I wrote that book and when I came up with the title, everybody that I spoke to says change the title. There was there was as I like to call them the fuck books. There was one fuck book out at the time, right? It was Mark Manson's book, and it wasn't really you know like shaking the trees or anything yet. And I and I thought, well, that's what I want to call my book. And people, are, you know, I'd written it in late 2015, and my marketing people, everybody was like, no. It's a great title, but don't do it. And I got it. Like, you know, you couldn't advertise it on Amazon. You couldn't post about it on Facebook. Like, nothing. No one would handle it. There's no way to get it out, right? And at the time, I had a coaching business. That was it. I wasn't like I had, you know, fucking gazillion followers online or something. There's none of that. But I thought, no, I'm going to call it what I want to call it. That's how I talk, right? That's that's my vernacular, right? I'm, so, so when I brought the book out, some people were very skeptical about it, like they were saying, you know, you know it's, it's just sensationalist. It's been a lot of books have come out with brilliant titles and never sold more than six copies, right? Title is kind of interesting, but there has to be something in there. But what I was committed to do with that book, Tom, was pack in as much really useful philosophy, communicated in a way that there was plenty of room for you to think. Right. So there was like these big, like I'd make these statements, but you had to kind of dwell on it. You'd be like, oh, whoa, let me think about that for a minute. Right. From the perspective of my life. And so there's only, I think, 32,000 words in that book. But there's like so much philosophy in that book. Even I was shocked that I managed to get it all in there, you know. But so and, and again, it's this kind of phenomenological, ontological, existential perspective but the book went crazy i self-published it went like thirty thousand copies in five months you know it just spread it was like wildfire people were like oh my gosh i love this book and then so when i got my publisher my publisher said you know why don't we do something long term where you could really get to create with people this kind of bigger picture and uh, that's what we've done we've it's really been like I'm, I'm filling in the gaps for people with every book, but that every book you can stand alone with a book, and on its own it's very valuable. You might never read another book of mine, but but if you do read all the books, you'll see how they all come together, and they do feed off each other. Um, so this book that's that's my next book that's coming out. It's called Wise as Fuck, and it's simple truths to guide you through the shit storms of life. And, and again, you know, like, I want everybody to get some of the brilliant philo- philosophical ideas that exist in the world. I want everybody to get them. And, and so th- in that way, I speak to people in the way that they talk and the way that you and I would communicate. It's not wrapped up in a strategy or some, you know, some scheme that I might have. It really is a simplistic and powerful way of delivering some of the great distinctions of philosophy that the world has ever produced. Um, and that they're accessible and they're usable and, and you can find a way to kind of integrate them into your life. And um, and I'm going to continue on that pathway. I've got a lot of things that I want to touch on with people, but this this next piece is a really important piece. You know, it's very important. How do you deal with loss? You know, how do you deal with fear? You know, or 
what is success as a human being? Like, what you know, we're it's like we should know how to handle all that stuff, but we don't. We don't know how to handle. I mean, when somebody dies, I mean, you know, the best you can hope for is that somebody gives you some words out of a sympathy card that might ring your bell for a few minutes and calm you down. You've talked about confidence being an experience. Yeah. It's not something you don't, you aren't sort of permanently confident. It's just something that you experience. It, do you have a similar feeling around grief? Yeah. And if, if grief is but an experience, how are you placing it somewhere? Yeah. Yeah. I think, look, like all your experiences in life, you know, um, as human beings, we'll become a little obsessed by the idea of trapping certain experiences that we like and then trying to get rid of the ones that we don't like. So happiness is an experience, okay? So I might somebody might present me with an ice cream cone, and I'm like, oh, this is amazing. I love ice cream. This is great. I did. And then so that experience, I'm like, I, I want to get that experience back. Clearly the key is ice cream. I need to do more ice cream so that I can have this back. And then I visit ice cream 8, 10, 15, 30 times. And I'm enjoying the experience of ice cream, but I'm noticing that I'm blowing up like a balloon here. Then I'm not enjoying this experience. Now, this is a terrible experience. More ice cream is clearly the answer. Now, that's obviously a very kind of playful way of looking at this, but in a very simple way, that's, that is how we do life. We are in the pursuit of experiences. And we think those experiences are given to us by something around us. We don't realize that we are the architect, the creator, and the vehicle in which all of this gets expressed. So we look for love. We look, and we literally say, pursue happiness. Like it's something out there that I can get, right? And again, this notion that we can somehow trap it with ourselves. But you'll notice your experience, you might love a human being, but you don't walk around in this constant state of love, right? Because you're working and you're working out and you're reading and you watch TV and all the other stuff. You you have these moments of experience in love. So when somebody experiences grief, I say, you got to let yourself have it because you're more like a conduit than anything. It, it arises, it's there. And if you don't resist it, you don't try and change it, you don't try and make it go away, it'll pass you'll get wrapped up in something else. And that is very much how your brain works. Your brain works in those very kind of like, you know, like bits of string. There's a beginning to the string and an end to the string. But if you start messing with the middle of the string, you never get to the end. It's always just hanging about the same thing. So I want people to understand, like, there's nothing wrong with a negative experience. There's nothing wrong with that. If you feel depressed or you experience yourself as depressed, that's right. right? Yeah, you experience yourself that way. There's nothing wrong with that, right? And... You don't want to dwell in it. And how we dwell in it is by lamenting it or hating it or wanting it to be different or trying to change it or trying to fix it, right? You you learn to function in it. And you learn to, you start to kind of explore life from that place, maybe if we talk about depression. If you explore life from the place of depression and you start to dare yourself a little to get a, a little outside the bubble, tiny little bit, all you need to get what are actions that I could take that are more aligned with what inspires me or what I'm interested in? These little pieces, you can add them up. You can start to dance with life a little better than maybe you would have done in the past. So these are all legitimate, real experiences of being a human being. But the more you try and trap them or the more you try and change them, the less you actually get the favorable ones because it's all chasing. When you sat down to write the book, how did you come up with the fundamentals that you were going to approach? Is it the ones that people sort of most often are trying to trap? Um, I'm curious how you selected the ones that you went into. I'll, I, and if I'll you would at, enumerate for people what you consider the fundamentals. All right. So, so for instance, loss, okay. And loss is one of the fundamentals that I talk about in the book. We all experience loss. When you talk about loss to a human being, though, they usually talk about somebody dying, right? But, but there's little mic microcosms of loss scattered throughout your day, right? So you're, 
like if you go to the store looking for your favorite coconut water and they don't have it, that's a loss for you. What do I mean a loss? Like there's a disappointment, right? So you're kind of like, oh, that's no, it's not a big deal. You're like, well, whatever, you know. But as an example of like something you had thought would be there or maybe even expected to be there that's suddenly not there. It could go all the way in your relationship. When people get divorced, for instance, um, there's a loss. What's the loss? The loss of the future that I thought I had. That's a loss to me. I thought I had that. It's not. Some people are relieved because they saw that future as being very negative, but other people are crushed. So there's this idea in my head that life and people should be a certain way. So loss was, to me, such a big deal. And, and we don't know how to deal with loss. We don't. We're not. And you have to learn how to deal with loss. You have to, and it's a process of understanding yourself and understanding what loss is for you. Um, but but this, this notion of if I could pick things that I feel as if, if I had some grasp of how to navigate these things, when they arise in my life, how much of a difference would that make? If I could, if I knew how to navigate loss, like, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't spare me from the experience, but I know there's a way that I can get through this and be my most empowered. So I knew that was a fundamental part. Um, another big one for me was success, because especially in Western society, we're kind of fed this diet of what it is and what it isn't. And I wanted to blow a bunch of that up, right? Like just, and I think I even started that part of the book off by saying I'm, I'm sick of success, right? But not sick of like, I'm so successful, I'm sick of it. I'm just sick of how it's getting presented to us. Explain how, how, it, how do you see it, it being presented to us and where does that become sort of pathological? Yeah, so that it's, it's mostly presented to us as things, right? So it's most success is things. So if I get my degree, that's a success. If I, if I, you know, get that job, that's a success. That bank balance, that's a success. This body, that's a success. Like so, it's kind of fed to us as things, and it's amazing when you talk to people about their big accomplishments. And and for many people, it's like this these years long kind of pursuit, if you like, of these things, like going to college, right? If I'm, a lot of people like they've got so much built into that. And the experience in my head is when I get my degree, this will all be better. Now, anybody who's got a degree will tell you that got blew up for them the day they picked up their freaking diploma, right? They were like, oh. <laughs> that's it, right? And that's very much how success is portrayed for us as human beings. It's something to get to. That when you get there, it's not it. And it's never it. You know, every time you get there, you're like, ah. I, you know, I used to be a musician. As you can, I mean, I still play, but I'm not. It's not what I do. And my lifelong dream was to play the Whiskey A Go-Go in L.A. Like, that was my thing, you know. And so back in the 90s, I did it. And I headlined there. Right, with my band at the time. And it was like the biggest thing. I'm playing the whiskey tonight. I can't believe it. And then after the show, I was in the lowest of lows. Because what I was left with is, that's it? Like, that's it? Really? All of that for this? You know, like 11 songs and we're done? You know? Um, so I wanted to burst, break that up a little for people and start to get them to see success in a different way and start to engage with life from a more empowering context of success and what success is for you it really isn't something it really isn't something you're aiming for it's it's more like a location that you're coming from it's more like it's more like an empowering and and powerful context for the way that you do things rather than you know, the top of some mountain somewhere that you feel as if eventually will be the answer, but only to get there and see there's another mountain. <laughs> Talk to me about love. 
Yeah. This was this was one of the things in the book that you tackle that I was like, I, I am very eager to talk about that. You talk a lot about unconditional love, that love sort of by its nature is unconditional. Um, right. And I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that because that hit me intuitively um, as not being true. But your yeah. explanation is very interesting. Yeah. So there is only unconditional love. That's the only kind of love that is. What happens you when you, you love somebody and then they cheat on you and you instantly realize, yeah, I got to get a divorce? Uh, it's not love anymore then, though, is it? So now I've got something called resentment. So now that's... Now but why, no. that, that, would, that strikes me, before I read your book, that strikes me as something that truly was just conditional. And thusly, I went from... Conditions were met for my love, and then conditions were violated, and thus my love disappeared. No, no. So, like, so, like, there's there are certain like there are there are certain. I mean, you're going to call it conditions, but there's a world in which I express my love. Okay, there's a world in which I express my love. Now, when they when that person say and you say they cheated on you, which is a lie, <laughs> right? That never happened. They did but what you, they you're did. You're going to have to explain that to people. Yeah, yeah. So you were never cheated on. You've made it about you. What they were doing was about them, right? I mean, they might even blame you and say this was about you, but even that's about them, right? So if I love you and you do something that I feel as if is no longer acceptable to me, that's on you. And I'm now choosing to take everything, all my expressions of love, somewhere else. There was no cheating on me. Why? Because I'm now the victim to you, and I'm unwilling to put myself there as a human being. I will not put myself at the effect of you. You make your own choices. One of my choices, by the way, was to be in a relationship with you. And when you're in a relationship with somebody, you are exposing yourself to the potentiality of someone doing something like that. It would be foolish for you to think that that's never gonna happen. It might, may well not happen, but it'd be foolish to think that's off the table for you. You should know that that shit is potentially on the table. So therefore, your own experience of being alive, the pathways that you take, you're having a big say in them. So the notion of love when you're fully expressive of your love, right? And this, I, I was able to write a lot of this because of what I got from my relationship with my mom. I, I really realized like, whatever she was going to do was just what she was going to do. And it was my choice to love it or not. But if I started to say, well, if you do that, then I'm going to be this way. Then it's no longer fully fledged love. It's like a version. In fact, it's even manipulative. Like, I'll love you, but don't do that. If you do that, I won't. You know what I mean? Like, So I had this real, like, if I want to be a loving man, I'm just going to have to go for it. And and part of being a loving human being is it, what's also on the table is something called disappointment. It's part of the deal. You can't, you know, you can't walk into Starbucks and not smell coffee. Right? You can't. It's part of the deal. It's... It'd be stupid to walk into Starbucks and be like, oh my gosh, what's that smell? Like, you know, it's Starbucks, right? It's coffee. It's not, you're not going to go in there and be like, oh, I really thought it was going to be like an oil refinery in here, right? No, it's Starbucks. So love's like that. When you walk into love, or rather when you express love for a human being, you have to realize part of that is disappointment. Or you might even end up resorting to anger or frustration but that's only because at some level, if you look, there was something, I mean, I think, I think it was, well, I mean, there's been some great um, quotes about love, Rumi and, you know, Gandhi and like just what it truly is. I, I believe, I want to say this is like a Japanese proverb, but I can't, I'm not going to put any money on it. Right. But um, when you truly love you can never be hurt. And that's fucking hard to be with. Like, you're like, whoa, what? But when you, and, and to me, that kind of love, 
is you only ever only ever really hear about it from like you know monks or something like they'll love another or they'll they'll give their life for love and to me that's the all encompassing nature of love and that as human beings what we've done is we've brought these things in that focus it and filter it and, and in many ways block it and if you really want to ex- have love in your life you have to realize you're not a receiver of that thing you're the broadcaster it's coming out of you and you get to say you get to be expressive of your love with another or not but if you're not being expressive of your love for another stop leaning on the notion that it's them and really accept that it's this is me and you know one of the things that I'm, I'm out to do and I'm, I'm really looking at this for, a, for one of my future books is the notion of loving another is your agreement with yourself it's not your agreement with them. In fact, when you're buying into the notion of loving another, you got to really relate to it like this is what I'm up to as a human being. And I might choose to not love you. You might do things or say things that I feel as if go against what I value you as a human being. But I should also be cognizant of that I could continue to love you but I'm choosing not to. Like I'm, I'm now choosing, this is, I'm going another path. Therefore, I'm not in some world of like, you cheated on me. I'm in a world of like, this is who I am. This is what I value. You're free to be whatever way you are. And I know this sounds idealistic and I'll give it to people in a way that's really usable, but that you're free to be who you are. But if there's a point in my life where I'm just like, I'm not a match for that, then I'm owning my change of direction. I'm not going to blame it in you. I'm saying I'm taking this somewhere else. Love in a relationship is your opportunity to express something, not get something. And I, and I, and I, I love that I'm on the hook for the love in my life. I really fucking do. Like, I love it. And I love when I'm tested. When I say I'm tested, I mean my bullshit's tested, you know? <laughs> I love when it gets tested because I'm like, oh, I so want to just like, oh, you, right? But then I, I do, I remind myself that I'm a loving man, I guess is who I am. And, and I'm, I'm unwilling to change or give up on the integrity of that for some passing emotional quirk. Dude, I love that. That, that is uh, the perfect place to tap out. Where, where can people find more about you and broadcasting love and not self-sabotaging and becoming wise as fuck? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously my books are available everywhere you would find uh, books. Um, I do all my own audio books, so if you want to sit and listen to somebody mangled or half Scottish and half American accent, um, you might want to give those a lesson. And you can find me on my website, uh, GaryJohnBishop.com. But also, you know, I'm active on Twitter, and I'm very active on Instagram. And I'm, and I'm even out there, you know, with my new podcast, which is out there called Unfuck Nation. And, uh, and it's it's not an interview platform. It's really an opportunity for me to just rant <laughs> once a week, just rant to people and rant to the world and, 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 and give people, you know, what I've got to the best of my ability in such a way that it makes a difference for them. I love it. Dude, thank you so much for coming on. This was so much fun. I really enjoyed your book. Um, I'm sure other people will. The No Bullshit Style is is a breath of fresh air. Uh, so thank you for all of that. Everybody, if you haven't, be sure to dive into his world. And speaking of things that if you haven't done, you should. Be sure to subscribe here. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. All of the experiences that I've had or all the experiences that you have, your idea of Tom is just this vast collection of narratives that you've constructed around your own experiences.